Thank you, and thank you for the very kind invite. Um, so yeah, so I start off with the some of you will probably recognise this is the uh, Pixar movie Wally, where the, the little robot Wally has been left on a apocalyptic Earth, uh, post apocalyptic Earth rather, and um, amidst all the rubble, he's left there to discover. Um, green shoots, as it were, when is it going to be habitable again? And uh, he spends his time going around and recycling things and making them into other objects. So it seems an appropriate uh, way of introducing it. Um, and when I started doing this uh, a few years ago, it was sort of um, stuff that we were funding out of my group core funds and working in collaboration with student projects on some of our industry sponsors to build up links for doing different works. But of course, the circular economy and sustainability has become pretty big. Uh, when I started it, I think some of my colleagues who were much more hard rock geologists thought I was uh, indulging in a waste of time, so I took that and flipped it around and did it again. So we'll be happy here today. So I'll start off with some facts, lest I forget to be able to run out of time. Sometimes inevitably it is. Um, so we, we worked a lot over this, is a, probably some, some work I really don't get that many chances to present, and it's not. Uh, my group is a, a fundamentally a surface science group. We do a lot of work with materials companies, oil industry, um, geochemistry in terms of geochemical cycling, particularly around mid ocean ridges and things like that. Uh, but this work is, is a little bit different. And in this work, we've worked with um, Brian, Andrew, Laura, the blazer won't work on this group, uh, Northumbria Water um, Group, or Northumbria Water Limited, our local regional water company. Uh, Chris Sackley and Nick Cox at the Coal Authority, who have the contracts to manage all of the pollution from the um, coal mines and increasingly metal mines across the United Kingdom. Uh, Hugh Potter is at the Environment Agency and is just based in Newcastle, just up the road from Durham, and he's in charge of their metal mines program. Tom Williams and Pete Stanley at Natural Resources Wales, which is the devolved environment agency in Wales, and one of our collaborators, uh, Jim McDonald at Barrett Aqua. Um, it's a company that does biotechnology for remediation and, and uh, these sort of things. And then these are masters and um, other students, some of my third year students who've worked on projects over the years in this area. And in terms of funding, it's been um, Natural Resources Wales, Durham University, EPSRC, and NERC. The KTP programme funded a large body of this work with Northumberland Water Limited. And then the Coal Authority has some funding from Research England as well. And to be had from as well some of their um, PCR economy. So, a little unusually, I'm not going to dive straight into some chemistry. One, one of the challenges we've come across is, is uh, when you're looking at the circular economy and sustainable solutions, is actually deciding what's waste in the first place. And, and waste, surprisingly, has a, a very detailed, but sometimes not entirely helpful set of legal definitions. So, the answer is a material is considered. Used, when the producer or holder discards it, intends to discard it, or is required to discard it. When assessing whether a material is waste or not, discarding doesn't simply mean throwing it away or getting rid of something. It also covers activities and operations such as recycling and recovery, which put waste back to good use. Now, I've highlighted some things. So, situations where material is considered to be waste in the QC, so when it's mixed with another waste, the whole thing becomes waste. So, if you bring something onto your site and mix it with another waste stream, then the whole thing becomes waste. It's very hard to portion that out. You also become a waste handler as an interesting legal definition. So if you bring a waste in and tend to upcycle it, you're not a manufacturer necessarily, you're a waste handler if you're not careful. If it's deliberately and illegally abandoned or dumped, for example, fly tipping, then it's waste. If it's uh, unknowingly or accidentally discarded, so just gives an example there, fuel leaking from a service station storage tank, or if it's required to be discarded by law, then it's when they're all considered to be. However, something is likely to be waste if it's left over a wanted or a burden or a producer. Um, one of the areas we've worked on are things like quarry overburden and whether there's anything useful you can get out of that if you're happy to shift the lock anyway. <laughs> something to comment while you're doing it. And then you go from is likely to be waste to might be waste if it's a production residue, has a low or negative economic value, or is hazardous or would pollute. So that defines and tells us what a waste is. But if we want to use a waste in some circular economy approach, you then have to go through the legal process of getting it recategorized as not a waste. And that piece of legislation is called effective waste legislation. And you have to comply with certain specific criteria, as it says. 
Um, the substance or object is commonly used for specific purposes. There is an existing market or demand, and the use is lawful, and it will not have adverse environmental health impacts. And there is a, an end of waste regulatory test which assesses whether the waste has been converted into a distinct and marketable product. This is important. So that means the waste has been turned into a completely new product. It doesn't look anything like it did before. So if you take any take off the waste tires and chop them up and make a place on the surface, it will popular to take the waste. The new product is different from the original waste. For example, non-packaging plastic recycled material in the new products. There is a genuine market and it will be used uh, can be used in exactly the same way as a non-waste alternative and it can be stored in use with no adverse environmental effect. So usually you have to have a very specific set of performance criteria that you can robustly prove time after time after time that your waste is no longer a waste but is in fact something different. So it's not as simple, we, we talk a lot about the circular economy and about sustainability but it's not as simple as going out and finding your waste and finding another use for it. It does actually have to go through quite a complex process. So if we're looking at geo and natural wastes, then they can be quite large scale and quite an impact and sometimes actually very characteristic of a landscape. This is not far from where I grew up in North Wales, it's been in all wake slate quarries. And these, these massive towers of uh, slate debris, you can see the runway, these sort of roads going up and down them. And this goes almost all the way up the mountainside. It's absolutely staggering how much slate waste there is there. Um, Spoil heaps, so this is a mine in Mid Wales, the Escamoy mine, and you can see the, um, this is the processing waste from the crushing mills from the mine. So this is the material, the ore material which has had the metals extracted out of it. And these mines, even though most of these stock operated about 100 years ago, those spoil heaps are still a very characteristic feature of the landscape. And indeed, because of the levels of metals in them, it's, it's rare that you get things to grow on them anyway. And conversely, sometimes, the stuff that grows on them, the lichens, are so rare that they become triple SIs on the basis of the very rare metal-loving lichens that grow on them. And then you can't do anything with the spot heaps and turbo remediation anyway because of the uh, species that exist there. And that's a, an interesting kind of, a, uh, we'll come back to that a bit later on, because it does impact on what you do. Interestingly, in the Holden Pond, which is just off to the left here, there's a car inverted on its end. And there is no road to this mine, I should say, so quite how the car got there, I'm quite intrigued by it. It has all the looks of being thrown out of an aerobate. <laughs> these are the uh, Edinburgh bins. So these are from the shale oil industry that existed um, in the Lothian region of Scotland. Uh, when they processed the shale to extract the oil out of it, these structures, and you can get an idea of the scale there. So we did a little bit of work a few years ago looking at the value of rare earth elements in these. And it turns out to be, yes, there is quite a significant amount, but cost processing costs to get them out may be non-trivial. Uh, another area of waste we worked on a few years ago was looking at um, shellfish processing wastes. Now the challenge with these is they tend to occur in very isolated and remote spots, so though there's a lot of it, then if you have small producers and if you look at the way this coastline works, you can imagine getting anything to a central point or having some sort of collection process is quite challenging. Um, and the shellfish producers found themselves a little challenged by some EU legislation which prevented them using their normal disposal route, but there was no real alternative to doing so at the time that the law was introduced, so they were given a period to try and adjust the new legislation. So sometimes waste can be present, but actually just getting it and trying to add some value to it is challenging. I'm going to talk a bit about this today. So this, um, sorry, the photo of lost resolution a bit, is a photo of a pool um, on a, a stream called Saltburn Hill, which we'll come to in a bit, and it's full of a metal mine um, discharge from the old ironstone mines, and it's got a lot of dissolved iron to it when it's underground and anoxic. When it comes to the surface, it reacts with the oxygen in the air, and it precipitates huge amounts of ochre. Um, and that's a very fine grained iron mineral, and we'll come back to that in a couple of bit. You can see it just a little ochre goes a long way, it covers the bottom of all the screen beds, it smothers everything in the, uh, uh, the, the waterways that it's present in. These are the um, coal spoil heaps of uh, it's a colliery near Wrexham in North East Wales. You can see again the scale of these features, and if you go to some power. Uh, fly ash tips from power stations coming down the A1 are also of considerable size. Um, 
And when I was looking for a photo of this, this one actually came with an interesting uh, little bit of history that the, this mine was so dangerous when it was operated. There used to be uh, a saying that you know, if you join the Navy, you see the world. And the workers said, if you come and work here, you'll see the next. So, <laughs> so, some wastes are not, um, are large scale wastes are not necessarily uh, just mineral. This is seaweed on Douglas Beach. And, um, this washes up in, in vast quantities, and it can be literally I've been there in this wall, it's been halfway up this wall for the entire size of the beach. As that begins to rot down, then the smell and the flies begin to encroach on the plant. So they pay tens of thousands of pounds a year to some of the unit tractor who essentially just picks it up and dumps it through the timeline, and the water washes it away. Quite possibly brings it back in on the next site. Um, now, interestingly, that didn't used to be a problem because if you went back, 60, 70 years, perhaps even longer, then farmers would bring down their trucks and they would take this away and they'd use it as a soil condition to improve the fish life along their beach. And that's also just a speech showing that farmers do that with their food. And that happened around the, the shores of the UK. And with the interest in biofuels and bioenergy, of course, if you're paying money to move the waste from one point to another, why not put it into an anaerobic digester? So there are certain things to think about. But of course, used to, when we think of waste, we usually think of water treatment works. This is seen uh, found up in the northeast of England, where I've done some work. Um, water treatment residues, so they flocculate out um, phosphorus using iron, we'll come to that again. And then they bind it up in a polymer, and those form large scale masses of material that they're always looking for a use of for recycling or doing something else with it. Um, they also now have switched from drying <laughs> ovens, which are very costly, to using aerobic digestion to process the sludge. And then the residues from that will go to land and um, back into the recycling loop. And again, here's another picture of one of these mines showing the scale of some deposits. And the water running out of these tends to be quite contaminated. Mm -hmm. So we'll visit that in a little bit. So we'll go back a little bit. <coughs> um, I started getting interested in this sort of stuff back in about 2010 when I was working at uh, CNRS Institute just outside Nancy, which is Baron of Stanislas, there in the northeast France. And we were looking at these type of minerals, which are a speciality of mine, they're called layer double hydroxide. They form these nice anisotropic, um, quite thin but very broad hexagonal uh, crystals. And they have a very high surface area, and they can expand, so they can take up um, anions into them. And the, the French government were funding a, an area of research to look at eutrophication and reduction along the French coastline. I'm guessing this all gives up, probably don't need to explain what eutrophication is, but of course, if you get too many nutrients, you get algae blooms, the algae dies as it begins to degrade, all the oxygen is removed from the water by the respiral organisms, and you end up with an anoxic zone, um, an, an anoxic segment, even though things may live higher up in the water where it's more mixing with the surface oxygen, but that bottom tends to be a uh, sort of dead area. And what happens also is you get these huge blooms of seaweed feeding on these excessive nutrients. And on the um, Brittany coast, we sometimes end up with all these lovely beaches again covered with hundreds and hundreds of yards and meters of seaweed. And one of the particular problems they have there is some of the seaweed biopolymers contain a lot of sulfur in them. So as they begin to degrade, particularly in big anoxic piles, you get hydrogen sulfide, which is a very toxic and corrosive gas. And even things like pigs and dogs have been killed by the levels of hydrogen sulfide in here. Um, it's a particularly nasty gas because your nose is incredibly sensitive to it, right up to the point where it's saturated. Uh, shortly after which you stop smelling it, you're going to likely have some uh, adverse medical effect. <coughs> so, <coughs> what I was interested in, oddly enough, so they were interested in making some of these nanoparticles and seeing if they could put the nanoparticles in model solutions to remove things like nitrate and phosphorus. And then one of my students wanted to do their projects close to home, and I realized we actually had a natural analog of this system to a certain extent. So this is salt burn in the northeast of England, uh, on the coast uh, just to the, the east of um, Middlesbrough. And you can just about make this sort of fuzzy, ooh, fuzzy photograph that you have a stream coming in here, which looks pretty clear, and it's that one there. And then you have another stream coming in here, which is orange, it comes in orange, and that's the screen that feeds off that big heap of ochre I showed you earlier. And as it comes down, it's orange there. Ironically, it sort of chimes with a lecture I sometimes give, and this is a meeting of waters in my magazine. So this is like a small scale version of it, different reads. 
Um, so here we have a, a wart, a screen which has got runoff containing nitrogen, um, nitrogen and phosphorus, so it mixes with an iron laden screen we would find interested to see if we could remove the nutrients using the natural system. Now, as it turns out, this was a particularly bad example because the ochre here was already pre-saturated with phosphates because the other formation the water flows through is a polyhalide formation. So by the time the iron was reaching the surface, it already picked up a lot of uh, nutrients. So the iron oxyhydroxide minerals, I think that the ochre is a collective name for several of these things, including ferric hydride, which is more or less amorphous, plus geothite, like a doxide, ferric oxy, uh, oxyhydride. And then on the form, it, it just looks like, as depending on the degree of dryness, usually it looks something like this. And then as you dry it out, it takes on these hues, and of course, they're used as natural pigments. So, where does the ochre come from? This is produced actually on a massive scale. So almost all of the coal mines in northeast of England were quite pyritic, so they had iron sulfide in them. So when those coal mines were abandoned, the water, the pumping of the lower levels ceased, understandably, and they started to flood with groundwater. As the water rises up through the mine, it reacted with these iron sulfide minerals, and it produces sulfuric acid and dissolved iron. And it's a bit of a knock-on effect there. The more acidity you have, you leach out more metals and you put more acidity again. The other thing that happens is you remove all the oxygen from the water in during this chemical reaction, and you end up with an anoxic, acidic, iron rich solution. That discharges eventually as the water builds up in the mine, that discharges out of the abbots, the side entrance into it, or any other holes that you can find, and it flows down into the waterways where it reoxidizes, it forms that lovely orange fine grain stuff which coats everything. So that particular pollution is, the iron itself is not particularly toxic, I guess, but because it's so unsightly and it coats everything, it is a problem. So the Coal Authority, who are the UK government agency formed to deal with the leftover coal mines and the legacy of them, actually has a treatment plant, which is uh, interesting, and here are some photos of it. It's a dual mine water treatment scheme. So what they do is they take out the mine water, they actually pump it from deeper in the mine, they don't go and try and collect it where it's coming out, they just try and reduce the water level by continuous pumping. They extract some heat out of it via a heat exchanger, so that's a nice circular economy or sustainability loop. And then it flows down in cascades uh, and into these tanks where it's oxygenated and begins to precipitate ochre, which is then dewatered in a press series of presses to form its then got some lime added to it to adjust the pH to increase precipitation further. And then it's taken away for landfill. So that's a product that's going into that. And it has to be, because it has some other metals and things in it, it has to go to a higher level cost landfill, which is also getting quite a fine for disposal. So the Coal Authority has a very big interest in can you find, and indeed has had several extensive ongoing research efforts looking at uses of ochre and coal mines. So we got involved in a project with Northumbrian Water, who are a local water company. So Northumbrian Water buy an iron salt, iron sulfate, on the open market at about the same cost it costs to dispose of the ochre in landfill. So you have one company in the area that's buying in tons and tons of iron salt, and another one that's putting it into the ground. So we thought, can we see if we can marry each other? We started off in very simplistic ways, just running columns and um, also making some cubes of ochre bands with other materials to see does it remove phosphorus as we run it through. And you can see uh, if it's bound with a resin, then you can remove some. If it's bound with cement, you remove some as well. And the binders themselves can also have some cement in them because it's so basic, it tends to release calcium ions, which very quickly scavenge um, phosphorus. So we moved from different lab scales up to sort of slightly larger scales. This is actually on the Northumbrian Waters Works. You can see we've taken these kind of pond filters and we've tried them in upflow and downflow. Uh, it's running next to, so one of the challenges with most of this kind of sustainable use work we do is the volumes of water you need to act, test your material accurately. And the, the choice of bringing it back to the lab where of course immediately it becomes a waste product which then has to go through all sorts of processes or doing it in the field means actually often it's easier to do it in the field in situ um, which in some cases brings you to an interesting bit of legislation around water abstraction you're only allowed to abstract so much water someplace um, in certain areas 
not a problem here if it's on the water treatment works. And we looked at these filters. So this, this is a, a, a sort of um, a graph of the percentage of samples removing different levels. So um, and most of the initial ones we were looking at removed, and it's got the filters and the total phosphorus in blue and orange. And we were looking at the effect of different depths on how much phosphorus removal we, we had on it. And that was, it wasn't massively impressive. Um, most of them were removing only about 20% to 30% of the phosphorus. So we also looked at doing a very large scale with a much thicker bed um, filter, so it, it was a, an IBC. And it had uh, some filter bed tiles to stop the bottom flood parking, some sand, some other good sand. So to get the porosity, we were coating sand that um, one part of them could afford that sand. So that, that becomes quite important later on. Um, and we were doing that in a cement mixer, so all of a sudden I went from this nice lab chemist to doing things and things like this. And, and, uh, and the interesting thing about the opera is you put it in dry into a cement mixer, and with the shear, it quickly turned into a very runny liquid. It was, it was the first time we did it, the people on site refused to believe that we hadn't added extra water because so much water came out of the machine. And we were getting then, you can see, probably sort of 20 to 50 percent was the mean um, amount of phosphorus run. But the other problem with this is going back to this one to four sand ratio is that you've suddenly taken a waste material. Uh, maybe one ton, and you've turned it into five tons of waste material, so you've actually increased the amount of stuff that you've then got to get rid of at the end of it. So, um, having thought about that and then gone through that process, we then thought about, well, can we just take the powder and add it directly in at the front of the water treatment work to remove phosphorus from the center? And we looked at doing that, and um, so along here we've got, this is the industry standard, this is a very concentrated dissolved ferric iron, stuff they buy in. And then these are the different ochres um, from different sites around the northeast. We have a lot of mine treatment schemes. Saltburn is the metal mine scheme of the world. And you can see as we post the ochre, we approached our sort of, uh, this is the industry standard solution at the moment. We were getting up towards it at about one and a half grams per litre of ochre dust, which doesn't sound very much. But when you calculate it for a water treatment works over the year, you suddenly realize the amount of sludge they're going to have to remove becomes significantly bigger. Um, for them, that's a, 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 a not a uh, thing that they would be keen to do because they then have to pass all that sludge through their treatment works, their anaerobic digesters, and uh, process it afterwards. So <clears throat> we then did something else. So this, this is uh, what I call my alchemist. If anybody's ever read the book, The Alchemist, it's a book that at the end takes you back to the beginning and that's what this, this project did in a sense because we got towards the end and we realized actually if they buy in dissolved iron salts on perhaps the best thing we can do with the ochre is turn it back into dissolved iron salt because mineral acids are cheap and that's essentially what we did so this far on the left here so this is um, one of them is total phosphorus and the other is dissolved phosphorus that's going to be total phosphorus is salt um, and these are, this is the ferric sulfate, so that's the standard treatment, and that removes 60% of the phosphorus in test, that is natural, but that is usual dosing rate of uh, 60 parts per uh, no, that's yeah, 60, I think that was. And then we looked at what happened if we increased the dose rate, because we weren't making such a concentrated ion solution, can we get as good removal with a dissolved ion salt made from the ochre? And the answer, as you can see, is yes, it, it's pretty much. Um, you can see that we're getting there with it. And these are two different ones, Gordon and Bates. We then look at dose rate versus percentage from the water. The other thing that happens when you dose with iron salts is you get a pH adjustment with the soluble iron salts form. So you can see the pH in red goes down as you increase the iron concentration. The phosphorus removal, interestingly, goes down very rapidly and then at about 12 bits per litre or 12 bits then it starts to climb back up. So you can almost use the pH adjustment as a measure of how much, because one of the things which you want to know when you're doing it at large scale is are you adding too much or too little? And you can almost use the pH effect to measure that easily. And indeed, we went to making this stuff in the uh, tens of meters scale, so, and deploying it on some of the bridge water treatment works, um, looking at the removal of phosphorus from this, this trial plant. So 
you ask about web failure, but this is something that's gone from kind of landscape all the way up to deployment, and we're now looking at the next stage of funding to take it into, you know, the next thing we need to do is run a year-long trial on this and um, look at the operational performance over the year, but also how you make it at a large scale from the waste material, plus the business model, because our initial analysis suggests you need both partners working, if either one of them tried to do it on their own, there's not enough margins in it, but you need to start thinking about the economics of the process and who gains what from it. So there's a lot to, to unpick, even when you've got a solution that technically looks like it might work. So the next part I want to talk about is, um, this is not so much the use of a, or it could be the use of a waste material. Um, we've been doing a lot of work since about 2015 on metal mine remediation. So this is the Cumhasworth mine in Wales. The ore belts of, of the UK are fairly distinct. You have the Cornish tin copper systems. You then had Mid Wales all bent, where they had uh, zinc, copper, lead, and then the North Pennines, where it was very close to Durham, actually, uh, and then you've got again zinc and lead, lead in particular up there. And we also have a smattering of clear Mid Wales and gold as well, and silver mining, it's a dependent marine mine. So the mines are, um, this is it in its heyday, all those buildings are now ruined, some of the floors are still there, and then you've got a bit of Camping deal. Um, so this 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 particular mine is inspecting up here. This is a, called Bring Copper or Copper Hill, and that goes back to the Bronze Age. The mines on the top of that, and of course, originally the miners were striking the veins on the surface of the ground and seeing where the water broke it away, and just surface mining it. And then in time, they would dig little bell pits and get more out. And then when they ran out of the limits of that, they would follow the veins down. Um, and you can see them intersecting the sides of the hillside either by going in or coming down from the bottom. And um, most of the, the metals are located in quite distinct veins in mid Wales and sometimes flats, which are the horizontal ones in the North Pennine or the Orkney. So these mines went out of business, most of them before the 1950s or the 1970s, and no legislation existed until later to enact that people must clean up pollution that arose from mines. So no one is essentially liable for pollution from these mine systems. And a lot of them, of course, going back 100 years or more when they ceased operation, tracking down the owners or anybody who has any part of the ownership of them is, in, is incredibly difficult. And a lot of these ones in particular went out of business when it was cheaper to bring oil in from Australia than actually digging it in the country. So again, uh, as before with the coal mines, what happens is when you stop pumping the lower levels, the water floods in. Now, particularly in areas like Wales and the North Pennines, because water is one thing that's not in short supply. And it fills up the levels, dissolves the metals out, which then, as the water runs up, again, it comes fast out. This would have been an added going into the hill that a miner could have walked into the mine through to intercept the vertical um, metal uh, deposits. And you can see here there's been a rear on it for flow modeling. Uh, and you've also got some ochre in this one, but not all of these metal mine discharges have got ochre in them, so some of them look clean, as in visually clean, but have very high levels of lead, zinc, and cadmium, which show no actual colour or precipitate in them. <coughs> so we've been looking at using, um, we've introduced the concept of phyto remediation, which is not phyto being plant, phyto being anything to do with algae. Um, and, and in terms of algae, there are two main forms. We really spend longer this year. Microalgae, which is a single cell organism, which is probably more about these things than I do. And macroalgae, which is the um, seaweed float model. And again, the kelp comes in different varieties the browns, the greens, uh, the, the golds, the greens, and the reds. Now, interestingly, um, seaweed has a, a credit to the bottom of the bottom. Uh, has a, a, a very high affinity naturally for metal. So, Fucus physiculosis, which is the brand one that you see almost on each of the nodules in the box. Uh, Ascophyllum is another species which have bigger nodules in it, and it's a little bit more filamentous. Um, but you can see naturally the background seawater is very low in terms of concentration of these metals, but the amount we find in the organism is considerable. We've actually looked at rhenium in some of these seaweeds. Rhenium has no biological use, but it's 10,000-fold um, concentrated relative to the background 
So it's been taken in as a, an error for something else and stored in. Uh, right. Now, the reason that you have these uh, metal affinities is because of polymer alginic acid. Um, and this is generated in industry of its own because it's hydrocolloid, so it also picks up water, so you can use it in nappies, and you can cast it into films and use it as a, a membrane on foods, for example. And it's a, a sugar polymer, um, but the sugars are a little unusual and they have carboxylic acid groups on it. Um, and it's those carboxylic acid groups, amongst other things, that allow it to form a certain structure. So one of the things it does is it forms this, um, the GG groups form this sort of cavity shape, which when put together forms this, they call it an egg box model because all the world is just like an egg box model. So when you add a soluble divalent ion, if calcium to it, it goes from being a viscous solution to being a gel very quickly, which means you can form it into beads or films or other resilient structures. There are other biopolymers, so some are sulfonated. Uh, this is fucoidin from the fuca series. There is no commercial industry for that, so it's much more expensive than alginate at the moment. And seaweeds also um, can take up some of the uh, metals even after they've had the cell wall where most of the alginate is. So they have other mechanisms as well for removing metals, including things like phycopeptins, which are amino acids and peptide linkages, particularly ones with sulfur on them, absorbing things like caffeine. So they're very sensitive to metal pollution and concentrated metal pollution. So the concept is you take a metal laden water. You pass it through a cap column of your beads, which you can form as drowsy, and you get cleaner water at the bottom. Over time, you find that the efficiency will get breakthrough. So if you keep adding it through, and what will happen is the concentration of bottles suddenly start to increase because you reach the point at which the beads can't take out enough metals quickly enough to keep up with the input. And that doesn't necessarily interestingly mean the beads are fully saturated. To recover the metal, you then can put an acid solution through a concentrated uh, metal solution. So some of the things you start thinking about are things that chemists don't normally think, such as pore volumes, bed volumes, absorption capacity, the breakthrough volume, <coughs> permeability and recyclability. So we started this off by some SBRI funding by Natural Resources Wales with the idea they were trying to get different technologies benchmarked against each other to see if they can use uh, different methods for treating these metal lines and then they were taking forward different technologies into the future. <clears throat> so we looked at the, the initial thing was just a lab scale test. We made our alginate by dropping it through a needle, and as it falls through the air, it forms a bead, and then it lands in calcium chloride, and it forms these nice three or four millimeter bead structure. So um, the first part was a feasibility study, so we just did some lab work. Uh, we looked at also of another pectin, which is another gelling structure, but it's, it doesn't, it's not as efficient as alginate. So in the end, we ended up sticking with alginate. And the site we were interested in is this Muscovit mine. And there are two adits, <laughs> a silk adit and a cuse adit. One of them is an ochreous one, and the other is a, a clear one. And they're quite convenient. This is uh, deceptively uh, mild looking, but the wind howls up this valley all year round. And um, the only day when it wasn't even windy or rainy, and we, we thought, hallelujah, we've got a nice day. There were so many midges that actually we were soon wishing for the rain and the wind. So we made up some lab solutions <coughs> based on the water chemistry there. And um, this is looking at zinc absorption. And we did it at high concentration range. So this is up to 20,000, um, so 20 meters per liter, I guess. And then this is down at 250 uh, micrograms per liter. And the green and the red line are the environmental quality standards, which are the reason that the different agencies are being pushed towards treating these metal mined waters. Um, the European Union Water Framework Directive sets an amount of metals that are acceptable to be found in the environment. And we took these water solutions, we treated them with our beads just in a batch reactor um, for up to 24 hours. And you can see for the zinc, um, there are two, uh, there's a metal solution which is just zinc on its own, and then these are the two waters from the mines to see if there's any interference effects that happen. And actually it looks like that, you know, despite there's other metals in there, it doesn't seem to impact the zinc absorption too much. You can see zinc, it comes down rapidly initially, and then when it gets to about 50%, it tails off quite quickly, and you don't really get towards um, full absorption at high concentrations. Uh, that's the cadmium, so again, it comes down at a certain point and then tails off. But this is quite rapid, this initial 50% is like 10 minutes, 
And then lead, lead it really likes it. Pours that lead from water. Within 10 minutes, you've removed over 95% <coughs> of um, lead in the air. You can see that it's not consistently. And if we put it all together, at five minutes residence time in the BP, you get 56% zinc, 43% cadmium, give or take, and 93% lead. After another 10 minutes, you've got 77% zinc removal, 67% cadmium, and 99% lead removal. I'll just add it on, so we'll move along a bit. <coughs> so we looked at some parameters such as flow rates to see how this impacted it, but we'll come back to this in the large scale trial. And we've started looking at how you dissolve the metal back out because that affects how many times you can recycle the beads because you don't want to be making a new batch of beads every um, month or so. You want to keep going as long as you possibly can. And we looked at a whole range again of different, uh, so these are the levels in the water initially and then after treating them with the different commercially available algae species, how much is left in there, zinc at the top and um, lead at the bottom. You can see the lead is very efficiently sequestered whereas the zinc is uh, not quite efficiently so then, of course, we wanted to know, well, even on the basis of our limited feasibility study, <coughs> how well, how big a filter will we need to treat this? So if we look at the full flow rate from one of these discharges, so it's about eight and a half litres per second or thereabouts total flow rate from that one discharge, how big a filter would we need to treat that? And at what retention time would we be doing with that? And it turns out at five minutes retention time, you would need 10,300 litres. Um, the challenge with that, though, is okay, so that's quite nice, that's quite a small filter you need to treat the whole flow, and you're going to get 99% of the lead out of it. But on the basis of the literature, which suggested your breakthrough volumes, the volume of water at which you pass through before you start seeing metals, that would mean you would have to go and recycle those beads with your acid every one and a half days or so, which is clearly not feasible. So, what you actually find out is the filter size is not determined by getting away with minimum retention size, it's more about how often operationally do you need to go back and do something with your filter? So for a 20-minute retention time, you'd need 41,000 litres, but then that gives you a greater than seven-day change period or flushing period. So there's a trade-off in what you're trying to do. And 41,000 litres sounds off, but actually it's not that big in terms of a footprint as we'll see. The other thing that's interesting is that when you work out the theoretical saturation limits of your beads, the breakthrough time is actually a lot less than the full saturation of the bead. So the beads are never getting fully saturated with metals, but the surface areas are, and then the redetermined step becomes how to move those into the interior. Mm -hmm. And we have some ongoing research looking at that, including porosity. And we can also look at the estimated annual recovery of metals, so two tons of zinc a year, half a ton of lead, and six kilograms of cadmium. So you're not going to get rich on it, is the message from that. So, <coughs> and then we've also then started to build this up into a, a bigger set of experiments, I'm not sure. So where do we look at applying, um, and why do we choose the areas we are? Well, in the UK we're quite fortunate in the impacts from abandoned long coal mines have all been assessed and ranked by the Environment Agency and Natural Resources for Wales. So this area is uh, divided in of Wales that impacted, probably impacted, and you can see here's the dust bits we've got. Okay, used to that, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's highly red. And if we look at the um, prioritization rank, then they give an environmental quality standard score, an ecological impact score, and a groundwater impact score. And the um, rivers we work on the Estwith uh, rank joint 13th and down at 24th. So they're a reasonable place to continue our trials at, not least because we've established a good relationship with the landowners and it's close to the road. So this is the old mine site. You can see those uh, mill floors I told you about that are still there. These are the spoil heaps and these are the roads running through it. There's that ochreous discharge and there's the other stream. And this is the river Asquith, which is the main river that flows all the way down into Aberystwyth, about 20-something um, miles away. Uh, so that's the footprint we calculated for our 40,000 metre trial. We need to go ahead with it, so it's not too bad. Um, we started off at a slightly smaller scale, these sort of quantum scales again. Um, the other thing that we have to take into consideration is these mines tend to be scheduled into monuments, so they have a whole set of protected statuses on them. You can't just go there and start digging trenches or groundworks or anything like that. Um, I mentioned they're also a site of uh, special scientific interest from the point of view they're ecological. 
um, and lacking a lot of cooling properties. So we can't disturb certain spot heaps, but nonetheless, we end up with some clouds. <coughs> Uh, this is the, the normal weather of the, the new region. Uh, you can't quite get the wind from that, but it's, it's, it's not a nice place to be. Uh, we then went up to the next scale of uh, trap. And you can see here, this is a 250-litre filter. Um, we have a, a sort of sprinkler system within the lid of it, a hose coming down, taking off water from the uh, mine site, and then the vessel is filled up with these alginate beads. Uh, which this uh, unfortunate student had spent most of their summer with it uh, takes quite a time to do. So we then looked at the data from this, this larger filter in particular, and this was done at a very low flow rate to try and get some uh, um, very accurate data. So this was at um, all the way up to about three minutes per liter um, on that one. And that comes out about 20 liters an hour or something like that. So uh, perhaps passing through the filter. And um, you can see the cadmium starts off at here, this is the PPM, comes all the way down, and then over the duration of the filter starts to climb back a little bit, it doesn't quite get there. And then it comes all the way down and stays bound, <coughs> even after 200 hours, they were out for about nine and a half days. And the zinc, though, if you remember from the before, we never quite got zinc down to it. What happens is it comes down very quickly and then starts climbing up and re-equilibrating at about 50%. So we thought, well, if we run the filter at 10 times the flow rate, so this is now at um, three liters per minute, so about 200 uh, liters per minute. Then um, what happens, and again, this was going for 10 days, by which time we processed about 40,000 liters of water. Again, the lead comes all the way down, and it's starting to creep up towards the end of it. And this now has a 20 minute retention time, which is what we were hoping for, probably, uh, if we scaled it up at full scale. But even after 10 days, you're not reaching saturation of these beads. So our seven day change around it is actually conservative. It's probably going to be two weeks before we need to start recovering or even longer. The problem is that it means we need to go into an even longer trial now, which means three weeks or four weeks in the And The zinc does what it did before as well. It comes down and then it recovers back up, but then bottoms out a bit and carries on going. So again, we don't see full breakthrough where it gets up to this limit here. What we think is happening here is because of the 20 minute retention time, you're getting a re equilibration of the zinc within the water. So you have some water that's cleaner, so you end up with a more dilute zinc solution. So some desorbs back into the solution, and you end up with this feature. The good thing about that is suggests if you have some in series, you should be able to remove the 50% of each cut of the filter um, processing what we've yet to try that. So what happens next? Well, I mentioned we don't get very many metals from the solution addicts. If you look at the market price per ton when I did this, then um, what you find is that you know if you're going to be lucky, you two tons of zinc and a thousand pounds per ton of zinc, you're not really going to make a viable self-sustaining operation out of it on the basis of it. Uh, unfortunately, in the UK, we don't have a price per liter on healthy ecosystem water, mm -hmm. so we don't have the kind of same drivers as some other countries do. But there are things you can do with your zinc. You can make micro specialize, as I mentioned, in nanoparticles. Uh, you can make a zinc aluminium nanoparticle, which has a much higher value, 2,000 pounds a ton. Zinc is used, of course, a lot in the vulcanization of rubber, up to 1,400 pounds a ton. And also in um, things like shampoo products, where you're paying 110 pounds a gram, so it suddenly becomes very expensive. But of course, you're never going to be selling it by the ton, probably. Um, so the value added is, is, is differentiated there. So when you start looking at these things relative to the value as a metal and how much zinc per Coming to you have, you can suddenly start building value quite quickly. Oops, I need to wrap up in it. And we looked at turning this, you know, from if we were making a sustainable process, how would we build sustainability eventually in it? Recovered water, recovered metals, what we go next with it. And moving the cost, if it's just remediation from the taxpayer, if you're looking at it as a manufacturing problem, you move it towards the people who are on the side. And one of the things that we, we sort of looked at over the last year and a bit is if we were going to commercialize it, what would it look like? Well, of course, you're initially being paid to build, just remediate your water. Then you start looking if you can sell some of the materials away. And then the other thing we thought, what you'd almost want is a sustainable metal certification scheme so that manufacturers who were selling this product would be saying, okay, if you buy our product, the metals in it have not come from the quarry. They've actually helped you clean up the environment. So but that, that's a vision for the <laughs>